thank you so much all, everybody for joining me today. Um, if we can, can ask everybody just to mute themselves for now, because I am getting a bit of feedback and it's hard to tell um, where it's coming from because we're quite a big group. Um, so just a quick introduction. My name is Zamod Lamini and I am the course manager here at For Good. So I might have met quite a few of you guys already um, during our different things together. But I'm the course manager, so I manage and run um, all the plat all the NGOs on our platform, so all the courses on our platform. We've got over 500 courses that are within South Africa, but also we've got courses that are in Malawi and also in Zimbabwe that are going to be joining us today. Um, with me on the call today, I've got the team from Habari Ubuntu, um, and collectively the team's got quite a lot of experience within the NGO sector throughout South Africa, but also throughout the SADC region. And they'll be taking us through the presentation today and kind of um, sharing what they have to ha what they have to share today. So please um, use this as a chance to learn, use this as a chance to also share some of the things that we might not know that um, you might know and you can share that with us as well. But I uh, really, really are excited to have everybody on the call today. Um, and just a few things I will be um, asking you guys to put all the questions that you have in the chat so that the person that's presenting can get a chance to then ask answer those questions at a certain time. You can also raise your hands if it's the time for you to be able to answer questions. So if the presenter asks um, a question and you'd like to answer, please just raise your hand so that we can be able to note you. Um, and then also, lastly, I will be sharing um, a poll kind of just to find out about your feedback on the session um, to see if there's any way we can improve, if there's anything that maybe you still need from the team that then they'll share with you at a later stage. Um, again, if I can just ask everybody just to mute themselves because we are getting a bit of feedback. Okay, okay, there we go. I've managed to mute that person. Alrighty, so I think before, further, without any wasting any more time, um, let me hand over to the guys at Habari. Tabo, I'm not sure, are you the one that's doing the, the intro for you guys? Yes, I am. Uh, okay, morning. Great. Let me hand over to Tabo. You can Thanks. go ahead, Tabo. <laughs> Thanks, Amo. Um, good morning, Hello. everyone. Um, my name is Tabo, and um, I, I work with Habari Ubuntu, which is a Southern Africa registered organization um, um, and has its roots as well in East Africa, hence the name Habari. Um, Ubuntu, which means welcome, and I'm sure we all know what um, Ubuntu means. Um, today we'll be going through fundraising and grant writing. Um, I will not be facilitating that this particular session. Um, some of you might remember we we might have met last month where we did legal and regulatory compliance. Um, so today we'll be looking at fundraising and grant writing. Uh, thanks to once again to For Good for this opportunity to work together on this. And to all the causes present here, thanks for the opportunity to giving um, to giving us this platform to 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 take us through what front fundraising and grant writing um, looks like. Um, and we've titled it Unlocking Resources for Your Organization, because we believe that uh, that's what it does. Um, it's not just about putting a proposal together or filling in a, a document, but we're hoping that it, it unlocks um, resources for your organization. Um, from on my side, personally, I, I've got just over 15 years experience um, in working in the NGO space. Um, and for Habari Ubuntu, um, the technical <laughs> advisor, Okay, there's some feedback there. I think someone has an unmute. <laughs> Sorry, Tom, let mute. me just check. I'll mute on my side. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm the technical advisor and business strategist. And as I had mentioned, with just over 15 years experience of working in Southern Africa, but also in East Africa as well. Um, so uh, for today's sake, I'm going to, or for the remainder of the session, I will let my colleague, um, Ellen, who's our director, um, to introduce herself before we hand over to, um, to Bernard, who will also do some introductions. Um, but if you're wondering who we are as Habari, we are, um, um, or rather we specialize in project management and, and design, and uh, we do monitoring, evaluation, research, accountability, and learning. 
Um, so if you want to think about us as your partner uh, for anything that is project management related, um, that's what we uh, we could refer ourselves as. So anything that has to do with project management or just even monitoring and evaluation of any of your projects will be there to help and assist. So feel free to call on to us at any time, um, even after this session, and we'll be happy to partner with you on that. So Ellen, over to you before we hand over to Bernard for today's session. Thank you very much, uh, Tabo, and thank you, Zamo, and the entire for good team. We, um, before I go further, my name is Alan. I'm the team leader or the director at uh, Habar Ubuntu. At Habar Ubuntu, we really believe that the power to transform society lies within small organizations uh, that really have a passion for respective small sure communities sure. where they work and where they live and where they do life. We believe that those are the groups to empower, those are the people that need their capacities built so that they can transform communities in the way they live. So I have worked across Africa, I have worked in Southern Africa, I have a passion for community development, I have a passion to see uh, societies change because of the power that lies in smaller individuals. Um, today, I'm not the facilitator, I'm just excited to have all of you here with us and I believe that we're going to have a good time together. We look forward to working with um, you in the future. I uh, just want to call upon Bernard now to introduce himself and to take us through the remainder of the session. Bernard, over to you. Thank you very much, Alan and Tabo and Zamu. Um, I'm going to excuse myself not to show my camera. I'm having trouble with my bandwidth, kind of slowing down, uh, uh, slowing it down. So excuse me for today. But uh, my name is Bernard Ojom and uh, with uh, Abari Ubuntu as a lead consultant. I've had uh, about 14 years in project management. And over the last six years, I've now specialized in uh, M&E. So anything to do with M&E, it's a passion. So that's what I've specialized in in the last uh, six years. And today I'm honored to be leading this session. Tabo led us last month, last month session. So this month, I'm be, I'll be leading on this session. And it's something that uh, is a passion to me as well. I've done over and over and over again. And uh, I want to pick up from something that Azamo said, that this is a space for us to learn and to share. And grant writing and fundraising has a very strong foundation in sharing. Who do you know? What is the, what's A, a and B doing? How can we support each other? So that's why I, I took that down because it summarizes what we're doing today. We're going to learn and at the same time, we're going to share. Um, today, we are going to be speaking about fundraising and grant writing. And this is a, a topic that uh, is of interest to all of us here. Um, and for some of us who had the chance to, to attend last month's uh, session on legal and regulatory compliance, you are at the right place because these two are tied. Before you start to even think about looking for funds, writing grants, you need to, to work within the legal and regulatory framework of your country. So that's the foundation for you to engage in fundraising. So that's why today we want to dissect what is fundraising. All of us have talked about it, but what is it? So the objective of uh, today's session, Alan, We are going to have two, uh, three objectives that are going to guide us through this one hour or so. And the first one, we want to identify uh, potential fundraising strategies. We also want to know how to write a grant proposal, but this comes with the, 
a disclaimer. We are going to look at how to write a grant proposal, but doesn't mean from today you, you're going to write a winning proposal, but it takes time. It's going, it takes us time to cultivate that art. Then the next one is uh, we want to understand uh, how to cultivate donor relations. As you might know, in the NPO world, relationships are very important. And in grant writing, it forms the foundation of funding, strong relationship. So the discussions are going to be based around these three objectives there. With that said, I want us to dive into uh, what fundraising is in itself. We've all had this, but, but what is it? What is fundraising in itself? Hmm? What is fundraising? If I, if I asked, everyone is going to come up with a different definitions, but what does it mean to us? What is it? Alan? Alan, next slide, please. Sorry, everybody, just um, Bernard is having an issue with his laptop, so someone else is sharing his slides for him. So please, um, we do apologize for a bit of a delay. Yeah, thank you. So in very simple terms, it's the art of lobbying and gathering contributions of money or other resources by requesting funds from individuals, businesses, charitable foundations, or government agencies. Mm. But the key word here is it's, the, it's an art. It's an art. So the more you, you, the more you do it, the more you become at ease with lobbying for funds. The more you know who to who to, to go to, the more you know how to package your messaging when you're looking for funding. So it's an art that requires uh, investment in time, investment in uh, in human resources, for example. Mm -hmm. I know organizations, uh, for example, that uh, probably have one person, two persons, which is okay. But when it comes to fundraising, it's important that you have a multidisciplinary team. You have a team from finance, you have a team from programs, you have a team from HR, because at the end of the day, all of them contribute, their, contribute to a successful fundraising uh, strategy. Alan. So what's the importance of fundraising? Why are we going out to, to look for money? I know the first thing that is going to come to you is because we need funds to run. To, we, we need funds to run our NPOs, to run our organizations, which is correct. But the primary or core importance of fundraising is because we're looking at how to diversify our funding sources you know how risky it is if you are relying on just one simple one simple one, one single source of uh, funding you are at a big risk if that dries out and then we are going to close and no one wants to close so that is why we are going to go out every day to look for funds to run the ngo to support the beneficiaries because we want to mitigate that risk of dependence on a single source. I've done a lot of work with the Save the Children. And Save the Children is one of those organizations that have mastered this art. They have a million of, of funding sources. So, and all of us want to be at that level, but they are at that level because they've invested in it and, and they've appreciated the importance of relying on on a variety of funding sources. Alan? Now, so where do we go to look out for this money? Because I'm sure that that's the question everyone has on their mind. So where do I get this money? Where do I get the people that are going to give us this money? So there are a number of them, but the experience has showed us uh, doing this work project management, 
uh, that uh, a lot of money comes from individual donors. There's a lot of money that comes from uh, corporate sponsors. We have so many foundations that are supporting uh, uh, NPOs, and then of course governments. But as 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 NPOs again. Internally, what is it that we can do that is going to help us also raise funds internally? Mm-hmm. So we also have opportunity to arrange for events, mm-hmm. galas, and a lot of people are going to come to it. And through this, they are going to appreciate the work we do, and we are going to have people that commit to commit to funding certain aspects of our projects. But the important thing here a lot of the money is coming from individuals. So what's our job to pick out these individuals, to pick out these individuals with potential to provide money to run our NPOs? So that is where we have to focus our energy. I think we'll we'll be talking about uh, fostering our relationships, donor relationships, and we'll talk about some of the strategies that we can use to to attract uh, these individual donors. So now that we know what fundraising is, how is that money going to come to us? How is it going to come to us? Somehow you have to to write to someone, you have to call somebody hmm, that you know, somebody you don't know, you have to write emails, so that brings us to the topic of grant writing. And we're going to try to slow it down because this is very important. Um, Bernard, if you're still speaking, you've been muted. I'm not sure if that was a mistake on your end. Actually, I, would like to, I think my cast, my, I think, um, my apologies, I think my cast accidentally tapped on the mute. So we want to dive into grant writing itself. What is it? In one way or the other, each one of us have put down a grant. And in very simple terms, it's a process where we apply to secure funding from either individuals, charities, foundations, or actually governments. So the important thing to understand here, it's a process, and the process doesn't end. So grant writing is a process. Again, from experience, we've had uh, scenarios where NPOs or NGOs are going to run to us, they need assistance, because at that point, there's a funding opportunity that has a, uh, that has, uh, presented itself, but it doesn't have to be that way. It has to be a process that is continuous. We need to have that core team that is continually looking out for potential funders, uh, writing uh, these grant proposals. Otherwise, if we're going to wait for that moment uh, when we've seen an opportunity and we are not taking, taking advantage of the grant writing process that helps us uh, get a stream of funds uh, for our NGOs. So grants are typically awarded to support specific projects. So I want to pause it here and ask, so then what's the difference between a grant and a donation? I just want to pause it there for a minute. What's the difference between a grant and a donation? Anybody can put it in the chat, but I want to know if we're able to make that distinction because there's always a bit of confusion around those those two two words. They seem okay. Yes, go ahead. Sheila, I think you've got your hand up, so you can go ahead. Sheila? Sheila, you've got your hand up. I'm not sure if you wanted to answer the question or if that's an accidental hand. The microphone. Oh, there we go. Um, Hi, Sheila. Yes, okay. there you go. 
thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, to my knowledge, and like I said, I'd like to be corrected if I'm wrong, a grant is something like where the government has a grant in aid, where it's granted to NPOs. A donation is a sum of money that you get donated. It's almost like an arbitrary sum of money that you get donated. Am I right or am I wrong? We were about to find out, Sheila. Um, okay, yes, thank does, you. <laughs> does anyone else want to give it a try? Um, or is Sheila the only one who's willing to give us an answer? Anyone else willing to go? Um, the difference between a grant and a donation. Um, it's Albert here. Ne? Yes, hi Albert, you can go ahead. Yeah, no, I think the grant is, is, is the funds that are already uh, planned and budgeted for um, as a donation to organizations and other people. But a donation, I can see it's the funds that maybe were not being, were not planned for, but maybe someone came to me and say, can you please donate for me? Then I donate, but it wasn't really planned. But the grant, it's, I can see it's the funds that were already budgeted for to be donated to um, organizations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All these answers are correct because both of them involve receiving from someone. It could be an individual, it could be a government, it could be a foundation. But the difference is, the distinction here is, one comes with conditions on how you need to utilize the funds. Okay? And it, it has to be used within a, a specified time frame. Mm -hmm. But the other is, the NPO uses it at their liberty. It doesn't come with stringent conditions. So the grant has conditions, stringent conditions that the donor is going to set out for you. Meanwhile, for donations, it doesn't have necessarily stringent conditions that come with it. It doesn't necessarily come with a time frame that you have to use it. So that's the difference. But essentially, all of them re involve receiving assistance. So that is what I, I needed us to, to really understand. And I'm glad people are able to pick up that, uh, that difference. But all of them, essentially, we are receiving something. Only one of them has specific timelines you have to work within, how to use that money. Uh, you have to provide reports, how you've, how you've used it. So. Those conditions are not necessarily uh, available when uh, you're using uh, a donation that somebody has given you. I hope that uh, uh, is clear to everyone. So, how do we how do we venture into grant writing? Mm -hmm. Remember, I said it's a process. Uh, it, it's an ongoing process. It's not a one day thing. It has to be something that we prepare for. So how do we prepare? And I want us to take this moment, also make a reflection on the individual NPOs, how we've been preparing to write grants. So number one, we it's important that you understand the environment that you're operating in. And when we say environment, we are not talking about nature in itself, but we're talking about your operation environment. So who are your community beneficiaries that you work with? What is it that you do? What is it that you do? So you need to understand your environment. Who are people that share the same mission and vision with you within your environment? Because when you're going to do fundraising, it's important to look out for those particular people that share the same mission and vision of what you do. Then also the community you're working with, what are some of the resources that we can potentially tap from our community? Now the fundraising, the fundraising world has changed. No one is going to give you 100% of the resources you need, but they want to know what is it that you are producing to match what we are providing you. So before you venture into fundraising, you need to pull out the resources from your community you think you can leverage on when you go out to seek for funding. 
Then another important one, again, unfortunately, normally we don't do it. We need to have a plan, a fundraising plan, because you're not just going to wake up today and say, you know, I think I've seen an opportunity here. Uh, it might be good for us and you jump, jump on it. No, we need to have a plan. And one of the things we always try to advise and encourage NPOs to do, try to have a five-year fundraising plan and assign people roles on how you're going to accomplish your five-year uh, five-year fundraising plan. If you can't do five years, at least do three-year plan because in the three years, you're able to secure enough funding that is going to keep you rolling over the subsequent uh, years. But if you don't have a plan, you, you run a risk of running out of funds at the time when you do not have any funders to support your program. Then the last one, but also very important, is you need to have a core team. And I won't stop emphasizing this. For you to be successful in uh, grant writing, you need to have a core team. You need to have a team. It has to be a multidisciplinary team because they all bring expertise when we write this grant. But if we do not have that and it's just one individual, I can, I can bet you, you're going to run into trouble or you're going to, you're going to seek for funding that doesn't match the resource requirement for your activities because you left out an element of, uh, of the project that you're, you're trying to do. So these are some of the preparatory measures that you have to take as uh, an NPO, as an organization. And you do not have to start writing a proposal before you've done research. Research about the potential donors. Who are they? What do they stand for? What is what is the the, the the funding the funding levels they've provided before? That is very important for you to structure your proposal to meet their requirement. And this also takes a lot of thinking because if you know they have the funds, but you don't know how much they are willing to give out to NGOs or which type of NGOs they provided. Then also when it comes to your grant writing, you're going to miss out that element because you didn't uh, do enough research. Uh, you didn't put a, a lot of thought in your writing and also uh, the donor. And then the, the other one is of course planning. Planning is the number one, number one element that is going to help us uh, when we want to, to raise funds. Plans provide you, for example, guidance on the monies that you're looking out for. It also guides you where to look for for this fund and who is going to do what on your core team. So. This has to be embedded in your plan as an NPO. And it's something that you need to routinely, uh, as a group, talk about and look at where you are, where you are as an organization in terms of your preparedness to apply for grants. Then how are we going to do this now that you've prepared yourself? Hmm? You've, you've scanned your environment, you, you, you've mapped out the community resources, your plan is in place and you have your core, your core team. So what are you going to do? So these are some of the tools that we use. A lot of us, I'm sure we, we've written proposals seeking for funding, but at the same time, I'm sure we have a, a number of us who are working the phone, looking out for donors, making courtesy calls, trying to find out if there are any openings happening, uh, openings coming up, funding openings. We've also been at events, and uh, we've not uh, we've noticed that uh, NGOs have not uh, used events 
to the maximum. Events open up space for us to meet different networks. And in those networks, one of the things that you want to be speaking about is what you do. And in the process of speaking about what you do, you're going to have people that share uh, your vision and mission and who want to contribute to some, some of your project resource requirement. Then lately, we also have a lot of uh, online applications people are making. So again, we'll show you some of uh, the online resources uh, that we've encouraged NGOs to use in the past, or some of the NGOs we've worked with have, have uh, utilized. But today, we want to focus solely on uh, proposals, because it's the major tool that we're using to look out for funding. So proposals are the, the main, main, main tool that uh, NGOs, uh, individual organizations normally apply to, to seek for funding. Alan? So what are the core components of uh, of grant writing. The, the, they are majorly four, but these four overlap. They overlap. You, you, they need to be applied together. So one of the, uh, the main components of grant writing is uh, a, a need statement, trying to understand the issue. When we talk about need, it's about trying to understand the issue you're trying to address. If it is, uh, for example, poverty, it's an issue. Poverty is too, is too broad. Let me, you, 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 you're trying to talk about uh, water. Hmm? Water, so what's the issue with water? What's the gap hmm? in that community? And what do you need to address that gap? So. That is what should inform your need statement. You have to clearly articulate the problem that uh, your project is trying to, to address in very simple terms. What's the issue? What's the gap? What's the source of the They are basically the issue, the gap, and the resources. Then the second one is, uh, what are some of the activities that you want to do to accomplish your, 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 your project aims? And this you outline in your project description. And when you do the project description, it has to be brief and concise, but outlining clearly what are the objectives of that project? What are the activities that you're going to do? and what's going to be the outcome of those activities. Otherwise, if you do not have those pointers, you're going to end up writing a very long project description and the donor is going to struggle to understand. So what's the objective of what you're doing? So what are some of the activities you want to do? And at the end of the day, what's going to be the outcome? And there's no donor who wants to put their money in a project that doesn't have uh, clear outcomes. Now that You've presented a very clear, concise need statement. You've put it down together in a, a project description. What are the resource requirements for you to do this work? And this is a very important aspect of grant writing because this is where we usually miss it out. The budget has to be reasonable, but also realistic. Otherwise, if it is overly huge, it's also going to discourage donors. But if it is reasonable, it's easy for the donor to actually negotiate, negotiate with you on how they can fund you. So again, this is where the finance team is going to provide us that guidance. Mm -hmm. What is going to be realistic for us to do, the activities that our program teams have put together, what is going to be the reasonable budget 
to support the manpower or human resource to do this work, what's going to be a realistic budget for us to monitor uh, the outcome of these activities. Then the last one again is uh, performance management. You need to have a performance management plan because if a donor gives you money and you don't have system in place to monitor the outcome of the activities, it's going to be problematic for you when it comes to making an account of the funds you've received. So it's important no, that... Oh, somebody needs to mute. So performance management systems have to be in place. You need to have very clear indicators, for example, objectives and clear indicators that feed into those objectives and very clear, reasonable targets. Don't be overly ambitious and set yourself too big a target. I know usually we say, you you set a high target. You set a high target. It's going to to motivate the funder to provide you the money. It doesn't work that way. It's actually the other way around. Set a reasonable target, then overperform on it. So these are the core components of grant writing. And if you master these four pieces, then the proposal that you're going to put out is going to speak to what the donor requires because uh, you've articulated the issue you're trying to address. You've provided it in a very concise description and then you put a corresponding budget to it that also helps us monitor our process. So let's go inside then you can watch your mind. We need to watch this. Alan. So now that we know the four components of a good grant, so how does a, a winning grant proposal look like? From the grants we've worked with, we've supported donors to work with, one of the things we've seen that has come out clearly is ensuring that you're following the donor requirements. Every donor is different. Every donor has their own requirement. We've had donors that even guide you on the text size of your proposal, the font that you have to use, the spacing. So you have to follow those to the letter. Then also you have uh, winning proposals, grant proposals have very clear objectives very, very clear objectives of what they, they want to accomplish and the activities that go along with it. Then also, they tell us a story of impact. And they're able to tell a story of impact because they have the issue that they're addressing, how they're going to address it, and the outcomes from those activities. So it tells a story that is based on evidence because they have a, a, a monitoring system in place. Then the other one also, they demonstrate a, a clear strategy or method of delivery. All of your expertise in what you do. So you, you know you're the expert in what you do. But if you're not able to put that concisely in a proposal, the donor is going to be is going to find it hard to actually understand the strategy you're going to apply. Mm -hmm. I've already talked about uh, measurable outcomes, and outcomes help us uh, build a track record of uh, evidence about what we do and the impact that it has had uh, with our communities. Then winning proposals. I've also had uh, real realistic which are within what the just ask you just to yeah, say a lot of the donors is, today. um your network just cut out a bit there so we didn't get quite get the last sentence that we just said oh uh, on the budget yes on around the budget so we didn't get the last sentence that you mentioned around that what i said is uh, 
the budget has to be within what your prospective donor is able to provide. It doesn't have to be overly high, but also not too small because when it is overly small again, it raises question mark. Is it going to be adequate to accomplish the, the, the activities of the project? You don't want to go back to the donor six months after they've given you grants and say the money wasn't enough. So we, it has to be realistic on, on the part of the agency, but also on the donor. Then the last one is around a sustainability plan. Now, I just want to take a moment here and emphasize how, why sustainability, having a, a sustainability plan is, is crucial. Because of the shrinking funding space, every donor wants to know, how are you going to sustain the work that I have supported, for example, in two years and three years? Because no one wants to put money to fund a project for three years, then, and after three years, the project is closing. So you, you have to convince the donor that these are, the, these are the plans, these are the plans that we've put in place so that even when you pull out, you're not able to, to continue funding. They are going to, it's going to help us to uh, continue with these activities. And sustainability plan is something that is not cast in stone. As a, a team, we need to, we need to continually review how the project is running. Uh, what are some of the challenges that we, we, we've met during implementation? What are the strategies we've used to, to address those, those challenges? In that way, we're able to come up with systems that help us sustain the work that uh, uh, the, uh, the donors are supported for the last one or two years. Even when they leave, we're able to continue with that work. Otherwise, uh, it's not good project management that when we run out of project uh, funding, we, have, we close. It sends out a negative image to the community that we work with, but also it takes away confidence on the part of uh, the government that we, we support when we do this work. It, it also takes away confidence of the, of the, of the communities that we serve. So sustainability plan, is very crucial. And by the way, if you do not. Before we move on, um, we've got a yeah. question around the sustainability plan, and it's from Mpo. Mpo would like yes. to know what does a compelling sustainability plan look like? And then, secondly, we've got another question from Mdebuga who's asking if you've got any templates of performance monitoring plan. So, if you can just answer those two questions for us, please. Bernard? Okay, I don't know if I've lost Bernard. Um, there we go. Bernard, I think we might have lost you there for a few seconds. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. I don't know if you've got the questions that, I, that, that they asked, and, or would you like me to repeat the questions? Okay, no, 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 I got them. Okay, I perfect. want to start with the last one. Is a uh, performance. We have, we have templates. And we've helped a lot of uh, NGOs, NPOs do this, but we tailor it to your work. Yeah. We, we tailor it to the nature of work or your project that you're doing. Yeah, so that's a yes. And how does a good sustainability plan look like? That's a brilliant question, and I'm glad you asked it. Number one, it demonstrates the contribution and involvement of the community that you serve. Mm -hmm. Number one, what is it that you're doing with the community? And what's the community also doing on the project? Are we simply uh, providing them assistance without them necessarily? I'm not sure if it's just on my side. Is everybody else also struggling to hear Bernard? Yes, uh, Bernard, I also see Michelle just put in the chat that the audio is really bad. Bernard, 
I'm not sure if it's your it's network. Yeah, we are really struggling to hear you. The last couple of minutes, three to five minutes has not been too great. We're struggling to hear you mm -hmm. on our end. So I don't know if maybe um, you just want to check your, your connectivity and then um, maybe one of you guys on the team can just take over the question from Bernard because it is breaking up and we'd really love a good answer for this. So um, if maybe one of the other guys, um, Alan or Tabo, if you can just assist Bernard with answering the question around what makes a good sustainability plan. And then Bernard, I'm not sure if you can just check maybe your connection on your end while they do that. I am on it. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Sure. Let's try again one more time, Bernard. Let's see how, how that goes. Yeah. So a good sustainability plan is able to demonstrate the contribution of uh, the community that you serve to the project. Mm -hmm. How you've built their capacity to take up some of the, the, the work that you do. Mm -hmm. That is one. The number two, a good sustainability plan also is able to demonstrate the outcomes of the project that you've done. Mm -hmm. So some of the good practices of your project, because those are the things you want to scale up. So that is going to make a very good sustainability plan. Then the last one also is around the resources that you've locally mobilized, that you intend to, to continue with aspects of your project, will make a good sustainability plan for any project that the donors would love to, to fund. Actually, we, we've had uh, we've had the donors who, besides the proposal, would tell you to provide a separate sustainability plan before they give you the money. So that goes to tell you how important it is. I see somebody has their hand out. Got um, their hand up. Um, Paul, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Please. Um, yes, thank you very much, Bennett, for answering the question on the sustainability plan. I just wanted to find out on the resources part of the sustainability plan, how do you say it in such a way where the funder does, not, especially if you do have funds that would last maybe a year or two, but how do you then make it compelling to show that the fund to show the funder that you do need the money, although there is money that is in reserve? Um, I'm not sure if my question is clear. Yeah, that's a good one, because you also don't want to demonstrate that you already have something. So why do you need this? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily have to be money. It could be assets. And this is that's why I'm saying this is such a good question, because sometimes the assets that are owned by the organizations, we don't look at it as something important, as a resource. It is a resource, because, for example, if you have a permanent structure, so you do not have to rent office space, right? That's already a resource. That's already a resource. So even when the fund is going to provide you these resources, they know these people don't need money for rent. So that is one aspect. Then the staffing. Let's say you have a running project. A running project. Let's say it has 10 staff. You're not going to move all the staff to that donor's project, but you can dedicate time, that the staff time to this project. And you say this clearly to the donor, that we have this project running. Part of the team is going to contribute this amount of time on your project. So you can see how you end up cost sharing on, on the staffing as well, without necessarily saying, oh, no, staffing is covered. You don't have to pay for staffing. No, it's not covered. Only they are contributing time to your project. Then the other one is, uh, is around uh, uh, the communities, mm? you, you've already trained leaders in your communities and you're going to work through these leaders to pass on the message or to help you implement your project. That's a resource. Mm? It's not in form of money, but it's a crucial resource. Even when you go to the donor, the donor knows in this area, they have this number of leaders they've trained. So if we're going to do awareness, I do not need extra money to support awareness activities, for example, because you already have uh, structures in those villages, structures in those uh, provinces. So that's how you're able to balance the need to demonstrate to the donor that you have resources that you're also contributing to the project. I don't know if that answers you. 
Yes, it does. Thank you very much. So don't underestimate yeah, uh, if, if I could quickly add there that uh, the other thing that I think would be very meaningful and helpful to the donor is to show them your assessments, your, your uh, regular assessment um, for the for the sustainability plans. So this is something that um, some organizations carry out uh, once or twice a year to demonstrate that they have, uh, first of all, carried out assessments for the uh, sustainability plans, looking at all the resources they have, uh, but also that they have set in place matrices to, to, to measure uh, what actually uh, is uh, good for their sustainability plans. So yeah, uh, and that is a report that you can share with them that look uh, um, on an ongoing basis once a year, we do carry out uh, assessments uh, of our sustainability um, uh, plans. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Alan. So monitoring and evaluation is also crucial in a, in a, in a good uh, sustainability plan. Like Alan has said, you've done assessments, you have evidence of what you've done, so that you're speaking from a point of information. So that's crucial. Any further questions before I move on? Okay, I see we are quickly running out of time. I want us to talk a little bit more about uh, relationships. I know at the beginning I said relationships are very important if you're going to be successful in uh, fundraising. Uh, many of you will agree with me. There are a lot of decisions that are, okay, are formally made in uh, an office environment, but sometimes the actual, the actual, decision was already made informally because of the relationship that you fostered with the potential funders. So every grant opportunity begins with building relationship. And investing in mapping out these potential funders becomes a, a crucial mission for every organization. So the question would be, where do I even find these funders? We already mentioned some of the events you could interact with these funders. Uh, could have been online, but that's not enough. You, we have to invest in them so that we, we strengthen them. And when I say investing in them, I'm not talking about uh, getting money and buying a, a potential funder, a, a gift. No, it's not about that but paying a courtesy call once in a while, for example. I know a lot of us think it's, it's such a simple thing and yet it takes a lot of our time, but courtesy calls to potential funders just to understand what they are doing, uh, upcoming, uh, their cup, upcoming events. Uh, and then you use that opportunity also to pitch what you have, some of the projects that you have that you're looking for people to support. That's how we invest in, in building funding network. Some of us like to go to the gym, but have you ever thought about uh, at the gym, who goes to the gym? What do they do? Hmm? Have you thought about that? It's a, a hypothetical question I'm asking, but I know you go there to, to work on your, your fitness. But at that fit, fitness place, there are a variety of people. You have, uh, you have uh, CEOs in that place of corporations. Mm -hmm. The setting is informal. So if you use that to, to pitch what you do, mm -hmm. they won't forget you. For example, if a funding opportunity came about, you might be just among the first people that are going to tell you, hey, by the way, Alan, there's this funding opportunity that is coming up. Are you interested? Is your organization interested? Or do you know uh, a partner that could do that? So that's how we build these relationships. Then uh, the other one is uh, knowing the donor. Hmm? 
it's important that you are able to understand the goals and concerns of of the prospective donors. What's the work they do? What kind of uh, projects have they supported in the past? What are some of the things they've been concerned about in the past? Mm -hmm. Is it supporting local NGOs? Is it supporting international NGOs? So it's important to know this information. Then packaging, mm -hmm. how do they like the message packaged? Because mm -hmm. the donor, every donor is different. They, they know precisely how they want their proposals to look like, what elements to be included. All this you're going to know when you invest in, in relationships, having personal contact. Now we're about 60 people on this forum right now. 60 of uh, 62, for example. But what Actually, connects 76, us? 76. 76. 76. Thank you. More than that, yes. Yeah. But in this group, how are we going to use it for our benefit, for example? Mm -hmm. I've worked, for example, I've worked as a certain donor that is supporting people working with children. I don't support children now. So in this group, probably I know somebody that's supporting children. And I know information about that donor that supported the previous project of mine. So I am able to provide that information right now because I know my donor. I've used this platform to help another NPO. So this is how it works. Fundraising is about relationships. Relation. I'm not going to stop saying that relationship. Let's invest in them in, in whatever ways we have to invest in them. That's the only way we get to understand the donors and the landscape, the funding landscape that we have. OK, now that is the donor. How about you? Mm? How about you? Do you know yourself as an organization? And I'm going to ask a hypothetical question. What do you stand for as an organization? What's your mission? Mm? There are a lot of organizations we help to redefine who they are. They've done work, but when you ask, when you ask during your initial engagement, what do you stand for as an organization? Who are you as an organization? So it's important to know the donor, but also know yourself as an organization. Alan? So you need to know your organizational identity. If you remember when Tabo was introducing Abari Ubuntu, you remember what he said, what we stand for. And this is exactly how you pitch your message. Every opportunity you get to interact with a prospective donor. It can be five minutes, but use the five minutes to chip in something, what you stand for. Then the second one is uh, knowing your strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Many of us don't do this, but this is the foundation of knowing who you are, because you know what your strengths are as an organization. You know your weaknesses. Sometimes we take weakness to be in, in a negative aspect, but weakness actually is an opportunity for us to, to improve. And a lot of the donors today are going to ask, what, what was the weakness of your project? Because they, they want to find ways to help you uh, improve. Then the other one is, uh, what are the opportunities as an organization that you have? Mm -hmm. So let's say some of the opportunity you, you have is you have multiple uh, locations you're, you're running projects in. That's a good opportunity because you're able to support organizations. Uh, I mean, you're able to support communities in different areas. So that's a, a huge opportunity. Opportunity also comes with threats. What are some of the things that could impact the work you do? I know right now because of the funding constraint, governments are, are becoming uh, tighter when it comes to compliance. So that becomes a threat. If you didn't uh, renew your, your certificate, that's a big threat. 
So you need to be able to uh, outline some of the threats that could potentially impact your work. So that even when you go out to the, to the donor, you are not shy to share who you are, but also some of the potential threats that you, you might encounter while you implement your activities. Then the last one also, which is closely related to uh, the, the, the SWAT, your strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat is what's your track re record in your province? Hmm? How have you performed on previous projects? Did you complete the project on time? Did you have issues with the donor because of accountability? So you, you have to guard your track record jealously, jealously. Anything that is going to punish your track record, you have to find ways to address it because donor, the donor community, the donor community, com they, they, they talk among it themselves. They know who they've funded, the issues they've had, and they're going to share these notes. And you do not want to be known for failing, for example, to account, failing to complete a project within the stipulated time. So your track record has to be clean. So that is knowing yourself. And if you know yourself, you have confidence in applying for these, these grants because you know who you are, you know what you stand for, you know your identity, let's say, let me put it that way. But you, you, are, you are also cognizant of uh, your strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats, and you have this good uh, track record that uh, you've uh, built over time. So again, hypothetically, what do you stand for? What's your identity? You don't have to answer it here, but I just want you to go back with that uh, and have a reflection on it. Have a reflection with your team. Who are you? What do you stand for as an organization? Because it's very important. So we just want to summarize this uh, using the example of a crop. Many of us in one way or the other, we've ventured into some form of farming. If it's not farming, I mean, you've nurtured a flower back at home. Mm -hmm. But for you to be able to nurture that flower, you need to understand the soil that required for that flower, the, the time for you to water that flower. Mm -hmm. You need to understand that. That's why we use crop to summarize how to structure your proposal. So crop, we use it to mean the context you operate, the relevance of the project you are selling, the objectives of those projects, and then the process. Ladies and gentlemen, if you, you stick by the crop hmm, and nurture it, understand the context, for example. When, when, when you're writing a grant, for example, what's the context that the, 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 the problem you're addressing is? For example, uh, if we are working with orphans, hmm, what's the issue? at your local area? What's the issue? How big is the issue at national level? And probably if you have the time and it's an international grant you're applying for, internationally, what's the issue? And what have people done about it? But what is the remaining, what, what, what is the outstanding gap that has remained that today you seek funding to address it? So that's the context you have to operate. Then the relevance. The project that you're seeking funding for today, how relevant is it to the community? How is it going to improve the welfare? And, and of course, now we're talking about the outcome. What are some of the outcomes that you envisage uh, from that project? Then uh, the objectives. Remember, we talked about the objective in the components of a grant. Of a grant. The objectives. Now, what, what I need to emphasize here, sometimes we have the temptation of listing so many objectives when we put 
to get that proposal. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to be strategic when we're structuring our objectives. Four, between four and six objectives are good, are good, because you're able to structure activities that help feed into those objectives. But if you have more than that, sometimes you're going to struggle. I'm not saying don't do it, but sometimes you're going to struggle. But because you're looking for funding, you have to be strategic. Look at the object, uh, the, the mission of the, the funder, for example, and then craft objectives based on that. So that when you pitch your message, it directly aligns with their mission. Then the last one, closely related to objective, is the process. I've said this, you are the expert in what you do. And that's the reason you're going to somebody who has the money but cannot do the work. Mm -hmm. So you have to articulate the process. What are the methods? What are the activities you're going to, the activities that you're going to, 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 to implement? Mm -hmm. Again, when you do the activities also, don't go into a smaller, smaller activities. They're going to crowd your proposal. Just look at the core activities that feed into your objectives. That's what you have to pitch in your, your grant proposal. And again, remember, it's a crop. Nurture it. Nurture it. And you're going to nurture it because you understand what you do. You know the relevance to your community. And you have the objectives on your fingertips. And you don't understand or you've got the best process. I mean, you've got the best activities to address uh, those challenges. So, lastly, every grant proposal is about persuading somebody who has the funds but doesn't have the expertise to do the work. So you're trying to persuade them. And in the process of persuading them, you're looking at back again, what needs to be, I mean, what's the issue you want to address? What's the actual need and what's the resource requirement? You have to persuade them along those lines. But remember, not every time you submit a proposal, it's going to be successful. But the fact that the donor hasn't uh, provided resources for project, it doesn't mean your project wasn't good, but use it as an opportunity to understand why that grant proposal was not taken up, why it was rejected. And they will give you that feedback. And that feedback is going to help you in subsequent proposals. Don't throw those proposals away. Do not throw them. Get that feedback related to what you have shared. Look at the gaps and improve accordingly. The funding cycle, I said, is a process. It's ongoing. It's a continuous uh, event. So if one is rejected, there is another opportunity coming uh, tomorrow. So don't take rejection negatively, but take it positively. Learn from it. Make improvements. At this point, I would like to open it up to, to us if we have any questions. I've seen we've used up a lot of our time. So, Alan, Tabo, if there's anything you want to add, please, you're welcome. Um, I think in respect of time, um, I mean, we're happy to field any any questions, um, um, if there are any, um, and then maybe we'll hand to Zamo. I know we've, you know, we we over the allocated slot, <laughs> and uh, and and yeah. So so if if there's any any questions, please do raise them. Uh, but there's an opportunity there also to to contact us directly. You can email me um, on the email that's on your slide right now, um, and my contact number is there for any other follow-up questions that you might have. 
no cool. questions Thank on my so side, Spurn. Oh, sorry, sorry, Ellen. Oh, I just wanted to ask before you guys um, hand over to me. Is it possible for you guys, because I know um, you mentioned resources and places where we can find, if you can just maybe share where we can find different resources and templates and those kind of things that some of our courses who are on the call today can be able to use. Yes, when we send you, uh, Zamo, uh, the presentation, we will send along with uh, a couple of resources and templates uh, that, that uh, we have put together so you can share with the courses. Yes, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you. Today we had the biggest turn up compared to last last month, so we're really very excited. And I think this is a testimony that uh, uh, this is a very needed uh, skill uh, in our community uh, among the causes. So I'm I'm very excited. I wanted to emphasize uh, that. Uh, whatever Bennett has talked about, we do. We do like on a daily basis. So we skilled in those fields, a uh, whole range of uh, project management services. So we have to contact you and we're also not expensive. So if I could just put out that commercial that uh, please feel free. Uh, to, to contact Tabo, uh, the email address is there. But should you, you know, lose the email address, please contact Zamo, she will get to us because we in touch with her uh, constantly. So thank you so much for the questions. I hope all your questions have been answered. I've taken down some uh, numbers of people that were asking for, for services. So uh, I am happy uh, with what we have done today within the given time. Thank you guys and God bless you. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you so much, um, Tabo and Bernard as well. It's been such an informative session. I think um, we've all learned quite a lot today. So it was really, really great. Um, to all of our courses, so everybody on the call, I will be sharing the presentation with you as well. And then um, as mentioned by Alan as well, I'll also be sharing some resource tools of where you can kind of find um, different kind of tools to be able to write better um, grants and to be able to fundraise a bit better. Like the Habari team have said, they are also available to assist you with any of the services that, that services that you might need. So they also do like M&E support, they do sustainability support. So any kind of those kinds of things that you might need, please do reach out to them. They're a very great team with a lot of different experiences in different areas. So please do go ahead and reach out to them directly and they should be able to assist you. We just really appreciate all of you guys joining us. And um, just after this, I will be sending through the presentation as well as um, just a, a, a quick kind of survey just to kind of see what we can do better in terms of our presentations, what you enjoyed, what information you still need more of so that we can actually start to um, cater more presentations towards those kinds of needs. But yeah, thank you again, everybody, um, and wishing you all a great Easter to the guys that are um, going to be celebrating Easter this weekend. Otherwise, everybody have a good long weekend to those guys that are here in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. You. Highly appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. It's a pleasure. Thank guys. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zamo. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Zamo. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Um, okay, I just want to give everybody a chance to jump off the call and then we can have a quick chat so we don't have to yes. call you again after this, okay? Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, 